Uh, that's quite the introduction. I just think of myself as an impatient wee busy. <laughs> <laughs> we can, um, it's true. I just think that the science of connection, what I call the science of connection, really deserves to be understood by everyone. And so I stepped out of the university in order to try to help us to think about why connection matters. So I thought I would bring some of that science to you today and try to help bring it alive. And I am delighted to be in this room with you. And the truth is, I have the best view. Because have you looked at the view out the window? Um, the lovely thing about this room is very often in many rooms in Scotland, the, it gets sunny, but then it messes up all the light and you have to close the blinds, which I always think is like such a waste <laughs> on a sunny day. But this room has a like we have all the best mix. So when I was putting together my slides for today, I, and I really like working with images, as you will see, I went looking for images of East Lothian. And I discovered the most surprising, unexpected thing. So I have brought you what I hope is a we uh, surprise. There's a wonderful new film on the internet from the library service called Fabulous Family of Can I ask if anyone knows this film? Excellent! <laughs> then it is a surprise for all of you. <coughs> and I have brought it, and we can show it during the break, if you like. But I'm not going to show it during my talk, because instead, what I want to do is offer you lots of tasters and tempters so that perhaps you will want to see it and maybe we'll take it back to your communities as well because it gives us a, a real intergenerational sense of what East Lothian has felt like, I think, and who has made up East Lothian and what kinds of communities have been created and whether they feel connected, or whether in some instances they might have felt really troubled, sad, tense. And if we really think about that, then we can actively decide what kind of community do we want. So if that's one of the images from this fabulous film, here's another one. This is the Amos family from Amosville Park in Haddington. This is the Dale family. This is the more of the Amos family. I'm just trying to give us some sense of the intergenerational length of East Lothian. And this is my personal favorite image from this because this looks like such a happy family, the Gitchum family. And this does not look <laughs> so the Anderson family were either having a really bad day or photography was so new in 1908, except it wasn't really brand new in 1908, but maybe the camera they had required them all to be really still. Or maybe they're a family who is struggling. So I wanted to put these two families together, side by side in my slides, and I will come back to them, so that we can ask ourselves, what happens that allows a family to have these smiles and to look this relaxed, and to have another family that doesn't look like they're having such a good time in life? Because for all that I really like to help audiences laugh, and to help us to think about joy and play and connection, I think that comes more alive when we keep in mind that it really matters. And that is highlighted we can, when we compare it to the moments that are not so jovial and not so fun. Which means that we need to bring sadness and joy together. And I did think about bringing, therefore, Inside Out, because that film explicitly sent that message. But instead, what it brought you was the family. I think that really speaks to what generations working together is trying to do 
is trying to think very explicitly about how do you build communities of belonging, communities where people feel integrated, and communities where there is energy and thriving at the center of that, rather than communities that come together with a sense like this family may have experienced. So this is what I thought I would talk about then in the time that I have with you. I thought we'd talk about connection. I thought I would talk about stress. I thought I would talk a teeny bit about dementia, because I hardly ever get to do that, even though I think about it a lot. And then I thought I would come back to building a community. Does that sound OK to you? OK, that's good, because those are the PowerPoint slides. I'm <laughs> OK, so let's start with connection. This is the key thing I talk about all the time. Babies come into the world already connected. Babies come into the world already in relationship. Babies come into the world with a brain that expects to meet another person. <coughs> Babies come into the world with a body that is in tune with the movements and the voice tones and the facial expressions of other people. I think this is amazing that we are born connected with a biology that experiences and expects connection. And over the course of the pandemic, the image that I have so often come back to to try to communicate that is this one. Uh, this is Daniel, and he's a Scottish baby. And in this image, he's 30 minutes old. He's in the arms of his mother. Daddy's not there because Daddy's taking a photograph. <laughs> and I have this photograph because they sent it to me. So Kelly and Brian work with an organization that I spend a lot of time with called Tigers, who in fact are the other co-founders of Ace Aware Scotland, Ace Aware Nation. And because I'm so often working with them, Kelly and Brian feel like they know quite a lot about connection and they feel really confident about that. When their new baby was born, and Kelly had him in her arms, and Brian caught a photograph of this moment of connection between them. They sent that photograph to me in great excitement and said, Suzanne, Suzanne, look, there's everything we talk about captured in a photograph. They wanted to share that moment with me. And I said back to them, you are right. That, that is connection, you're spot on that you've seen it. I'm so delighted you sent the photograph to me. Can I please have it now? <laughs> <laughs> to show to tens of thousands of people over the coming, connect, the, over the coming pandemic. I didn't quite put it that way because I didn't know how long it was going to last. But the point is, I have shown it. There will be tens of thousands of people that have seen that. And if Kelly had quite realized that it was going to be seen by that many people, she might not have said yes. <laughs> Because Kelly sometimes now worries that she doesn't look good enough in that photograph. She is worried about the image of motherhood that has now been observed by so many people. So Kelly's willingness to let me use this is kind of like my banner poster at the moment, is an act of great trust. And I want to highlight that because if you look at that and think that's really sweet, and maybe you think that's a creative use of science, or what, whatever you think about that image, I want us to remember, Kelly trusted me in letting me use her photograph. And she didn't have to. So we have no idea what is behind what other people present, and other people allow, and other people engage. And so I often go back to Kelly and say thank you for trusting me with your photograph and your son in order to help us to think about connection. Because here's my problem. I spend all my time trying to think how can I help people to get connection. And sometimes I think maybe you don't really need my voice as a scientist. Or maybe we don't even really need st static images. Maybe what we need are videos where the babies can show us themselves what it means to arrive connected. So that's what I brought. So this is a video which is, which is very scratchy. It's not a high quality television video. Uh, it has no sound, but it comes from an actual scientific experiment published in 2013, in which my colleague Vasu Reddy and her colleagues were simply trying to do something really ordinary. They were trying to figure out what sense a baby makes of being picked up. Babies get picked up, 
all the time, every day. We often don't think about it. In fact, if you just pause to think, what sense do I think a baby makes of being picked up? And you might even think, oh, Suzanne, I don't even know what that sentence means. Well, Lossie Reddy and her colleagues wanted to know was, was this a relational experience for babies? Or are they more like a sack of potatoes? <laughs> which might have appealed to some of the farming families in East Lothian. <laughs> so all we've done here is we're going to ask this mother to stand up here in just a moment, put out her hands, and pick the baby up. And because we're filming it, we're going to be able to see what the baby's doing. We've asked her to slow that whole process down a teeny bit. And you might be interested in the, uh, the lines on that green map. They're actually... Um, they are sensors, so they pick up when the baby's muscles move. So you can actually do a whole fancy graph about which muscles are moving, where in the process of picking a baby up you are. Okay, and I think I'm going to need to get Patrick to hit my, yeah, Patrick, could you hit that? Mom stands up, baby's <laughs> arms and legs start to crash, mom puts out her arms, and look what the baby's body does. Baby puts up her arms and legs and head and gets picked up. Guys, that's it. That's the video. So at one level, it doesn't seem very impressive. But if I get Patrick to hit it again, can we think about this? The baby's not been touched. The baby's predicting the future. The baby's put up their arms and legs and head in anticipation of what is about to happen to them. That baby's three months old. That baby has predicted the future of the way they will be treated and what the world will feel like. Can I say that again? The baby has predicted the future of how they will be treated. And they're only three months old. One of the things I find remarkable about that video is a three-month-old baby has just become able to hold up their head. Before three months, their neck isn't strong enough to hold up a, a heavy cranium. The baby has read the behaviors of the mother and has lined up their body in anticipation of what they think is about to happen, and their whole body is into it. And they have moved into the future that they predict before the future arrives. I think it is amazing. Do you not think it is amazing? But most of the time we miss the amazingness because you just pick up the baby and nobody notices how the baby is already engaged in that, how it's already communicating, is already a partner. Very often we kind of think babies are sacks of potatoes. So we miss all that connection that they bring with them. So how else might we do it? This baby's probably about six months old. And this little video went out to support dads, to show dads, especially black dads, to show all the ways in which they engage with their children. So yes, I totally endorse that. But when I looked at it, what I saw was the complexity of the way in which babies communicate, of the way in which they read other people. What we're about to see is a jazz duet, which nobody gave the baby the score for. <laughs> The baby can create jazz with his dad spontaneously in the moment as a duo working off of each other's rhythms, together pausing, and they're making it up in the moment. That means the baby has to read and anticipate and align with the bodily movements and vocalizations of the person that they're talking. Is it not amazing? <laughs> Is it not amazing? 
they're doing that because they haven't rehearsed that. <laughs> I mean, they might have played that game before, but they haven't rehearsed that particular piece. They're making that piece up in the moment. The baby arrives connected. The baby can do this. I love that you're laughing. I love several of you are sitting here going like this. I agree with you. I love that you're laughing. I want you to appreciate this. I want you to feel like, wow, that's amazing. I want you to feel joyous. Because I also want to remind us that that capacity for connection creates lots of fear in babies. <coughs> if babies arrive connected, they read everything as meaningful. They are much more observant and in tune with the world around them than we realize. Because they're trying to work it out. They're trying to figure out how it works. Their brains are not yet complete. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Their brains are not yet complete. They're building neural pathways in their brains that predict what the world is like on the basis of their experiences and what they see around them. Because they think they're part of it. They're not really observing. <coughs> they're part of whatever is happening around them. And so sometimes, maybe has to have all sorts of experiences that we don't realize, which are slightly more uncomfortable to think about. So that's what we're going to see here. This is another research experiment. This is at the University of Washington. And in this one, we're going to watch what happens when a baby is very happily playing because they feel calm and content. And then what happens when something odd, unpredictable, and slightly scary happens around them, the impact that it has on the way they are able to then engage with the environment and to engage with people. There's something inside. Let's see what's inside. This is a standard experiment. Can you take the lid off? He's with an experimenter and he's exploring a toy he's never seen before. He's sitting on his mom's lap. an interesting place. <laughs> and there are new unexpected people in it. Okay. That's Kelly. Kelly's going to say you can make it. Kelly, look at this. That's aggravating. That's so annoying. Oh, I thought it was really interesting. Well, that's just your opinion. It's aggravating. So when I say babies come into the world connected, lots of people think that is sweet. And they might get that idea from the images we choose. And it is sweet, but it is so much more than sweet. And I think we get that message when we are able to consider 
the less comfortable insights about what it means to be connected. Because as I'm going to come back to in a little bit, that probably relates to dementia as well. But I'm not there yet. <laughs> what I thought I would talk about first is stress, so that we can get, begin to get some sense of the lifetime impact of experiences that we have from <coughs> very early issues. So when I talk about stress, some of you may know that I talk about saber-toothed tigers and teddy bears. <coughs> And I talk about it because I find it's a way that really helps people to get it, even though, I'll be honest, not all my scientific colleagues like this. <laughs> so some of my scientific colleagues have said in little tiny sentences, but with facial expressions that um, doubt that they think this doesn't sound very sciencey to talk about saber-toothed tigers and teddy bears. But I think that that's exactly why people end up being able to remember because when people talk about brain development, and brains are embedded in our body, if we're trying to understand how stress functions, sometimes the scientific medical language that we have doesn't help people. So if this is a brain, and the brain is embedded at the top of the spinal column, and sometimes we kind of think that the brain like stops here, because that's the images we see of it. We've kind of got this idea that it stops at the neck. It doesn't stop at the neck. It goes all the way down the spine. The central nervous system goes all the way down to the top of your bottom. And it's connected to all of these nerves that relate to all sorts of other organs <coughs> in the body. But we don't think about those things because our culture tends not to talk about that. And when we do, we tend to use words right at the top of this, like the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division of the central nervous system. And if I am talking to parents to help them to understand temper tantrums in their children, they can't remember words like sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the central nervous system. Please laugh, because if you were in Astas with a two-year-old who was having a total tantrum, you would not remember those words. <laughs> So for all that they're accurate, I think sometimes they're not helpful. Instead, I talk about the saber-toothed tiger system and the teddy bear system, and that together they make up the stress system. And when your child is having a meltdown in Astas, they're in the middle of a saber-toothed tiger moment. Their body is under threat. Something terrible is happening to them. And it was probably caused by you as a parent. <laughs> When you said to them, no, you can't have that chocolate, <laughs> which some unhelpful supermarket person put right at their level. <laughs> no, you can't have that chocolate. So you're trying to enforce some boundaries. You're worried about healthy eating. You know that they'll be high as a kite and they'll not go to sleep. No, you can't have that chocolate. And what? ends up happening is that you see the behavior. We don't see the feelings that are underneath it. So a two-year-old, body and brain are doing something like, but you're my mother, and you said you love me, and you said you will love me forever, and so has been the chocolate, it's right here, it's clearly meant for me, and I really love chocolate, and I had chocolate all week long because you wouldn't let me have it, and I really love the chocolate, and now you told me no, and you betrayed me! <laughs> and they can't cope with all those feelings. That's too many feelings for a developing stress system. And so the baby, the toddler, tips over into a meltdown. Because they can't, their body cannot handle such big feelings all at once, conflicting. And when I say cannot handle, I mean they do not yet have the biology to handle all of the feelings that are going on in their body. So they get overwhelmed. They're in a saber tooth tiger moment. Our saber-toothed tiger system comes from long ago when there were predators like saber-toothed tigers that would have been about to eat us. And if you hadn't had an adult watching after you, toddlers are great to eat because they can't even run very fast. <laughs> 
So you need a biology that keeps you connected to your parents and figuring out how to keep them in love with you. And some parents can cope with a meltdown. Some parents will go, I know you're really mad at me. I know you don't like me right now. I know you love chocolate and you still can't have it. <laughs> so some parents can have an empathy to connect with the child's mixed feelings, sense of betrayal, and still hold a boundary. And some parents can't. So some parents will say, knock it off. I have told you, you can't have the chocolate. And it will not be helped their own feelings about the fact that their kid is having a meltdown and asked us. If Mrs. McGlinchey is at the end of the corridor going tut tut tut, can you know keep that baron under control? The community makes it better or worse for mother coping with an overwhelmed toddler, coping with what Mrs. McGlinchey thinks, coping with the people who put the chocolate there in the first place. <laughs> so Lorene, one of the questions will become, how much do the supermarkets in East Lothian know about this shit? <laughs> you could have a relational supermarket. You could have a trauma-informed ASTAS. What would that look like? Well, until ASTA understands, or Morrison's, or Safeway, that they actually have a biological impact on children, and they make things better or worse for parents, then they don't think about that, because they don't know about saber-toothed tiger systems. And we need them to, because there are parents all over the country who are embarrassed by their <coughs> children, and the people around them don't help. What we need is to be able it, look, we're all going to have saber-toothed tiger moments. I do not mean that you like get a life that ever has saber-toothed tiger moments not in it. This is part of being alive. This is a saber-toothed tiger moment and a saber-toothed tiger system. That's fine to have them. Where health comes in is when you can get back to a teddy bear system. So, so teddy bear systems do what it says on the tin. Teddy bear systems are a place of relaxation, of breathing calmly, of comfort, of safety. I mean, the only point of having a teddy bear is that you feel safe and warm and connected and like you've got company. That's the parasympathetic division of the central nervous system. But it's easier to remember the teddy bear system. If we can get back there, then we have health. That's a healthy stress system. But there are tons of us in this country that the saber-toothed tiger system becomes our default system. That we find it difficult to get back to a teddy bear system. Or that even if, if we can get back here, we're easily triggered into this system. So when you're easily triggered into this system, your body is under threat. Your body feels scared. It may not sound as like the betrayal of chocolate sounds like you're about to get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. But that's why I like to talk about it this way, because it is the same core system. You're in the zone now of threat and fear. And lots of our children have lots of experiences in this. And the more experiences you have with this, with no one to help you, the more embedded it becomes, the more it becomes your default. So one of our questions is, how do you create teddy bear experiences and teddy bear communities? But you can't do that until people understand how the stress system works. And I think sometimes our big language doesn't help us to do that. So does this language help you? Yeah? OK, good. Because that means it's possible to think about the other language that we might bring to that. So instead of calling it a stress system, you might call it a self-regulatory system. In other words, you can regulate your emotions. Lots of people are not very good at self-regulating. They're not able to handle big emotions, so behavior results from that. Our prisons are full of people who struggle to self-regulate their emotions. Our prisons are full of people who had traumatized childhoods. And they did things that we think of as bad. 
what happens if you bring these kinds of insights to the criminal justice system. You could call it a co-regulatory system, which means you need help with this sort of stuff. That's what early year systems and settings often talk about now. How do you have relational practice that helps children with big emotions? We have a push for more government-funded childcare. <clears throat> okay, we live in a world where parents need childcare. If every single member of the childcare force does not understand this, then they will respond to children in ways that actually push them towards saber-toothed tiger experiences rather than back toward teddy bear experiences. And can I promise you that not every childcare staff understands this because it's not a it's not as much a part of the training of childcare staff as it could be. Or you could call it the trust system. Now, this was already in my slides. I really enjoyed watching the word cloud because words like fun and belonging and community all come up. The word trust hasn't yet appeared. If you want a community of belonging where people feel like they belong, what that feels like in the body is trust in other people to bring help when you need it. Trust is biological and it sits in our muscles and our neural pathways in our brain and our central nervous system. I think that's remarkable. And what it means is that lots of babies have experiences that teach them the world is not really trustworthy. And that means they need to be so anxious and guarded. So I could talk about that at much more length. But if you have the flavor of it, can I say, if you want to know more, oh, there's a book. Okay, there's a book. Which is full of photographs and full of accessible language. Because it helps us to think, how do you get this information out to people so that when you're in ASDAs and your child is having a meltdown, that you can remember that they're in the middle of fear, and so are you if you feel embarrassed. How do we help people to be able to remember this stuff when they most need it? And how do we help people to actually see it? Because sometimes it's so uncomfortable to see people understandably step away from it. So once again, I'm gonna show you another video which helps us to see baby's joy and connection, but also baby's distress if they don't have someone to help them when they're starting to struggle. And although this will not use the word biology, if you can add to in your head as you're watching it, so this stuff becomes wired into the baby's biology, we start to have an idea of how it carries across a lifetime. So she'll have to look away 
look around the room and find something else and then look back and say, now can we play? And within three minutes, the baby has really dissolved. tissues to share. <laughs> Is this a hard video to watch? I watched some of you turn to each other and go, wow. I like this video because it makes us see what babies feel. That we often underplay, or we don't see, or we don't realize, or we get too busy, or just life is normal. And we are wiring stress into babies' bodies from the moment they are born, in fact, from before they are born, based on experiences that they have of the community around them. We often call that community a family, but really it's a community, because that family is embedded in a wider family, which might include early year settings, or ASDAs, or buses, or streets, or <clears throat> toddler groups, or grandma, or granddad, or drug dealers, or people who shout, or sexual abuse, or parents on mobile phones. If I'm pushing too hard, I get it except I'm just talking about what children's lives are. And I just want us to see it, because then we celebrate, and we really pay attention to the connected experiences which you are trying to build. It's not sweet, it is essential to health. And I think we are better at understanding that when we can see the tough stuff, 
but can I come back to say thank you to all of you who are crying? That means that you are able and willing to see it. And we need to help our world to see that because babies and young children have experiences all the time that we miss because of the communities that we construct around them. <coughs> Bab parents get ideas about how you should treat your ch children from the culture that they grow up in. We teach them. And some of the things that we teach in Scotland are not the best things that babies would vote for. We can change that. I agree with you that it's not hard. The obstacles are the ones we put there, often because we didn't know we were creating an obstacle. <clears throat> so another way to say that is, what kind of community do we need to build to build a tr to, to make the baby's trust system really robust? Trust being biological. Trust being that when I am struggling, when I am tipped into discomfort, you will come and help you to move back to comfort. What do we need to do to create that kind of biology in our babies and young children? Because that then provides the platform that is gonna carry across the whole of their lifetime, which does not mean that you can't make it better in your adulthood. There will be lots of you in this room who didn't have great childhoods, that, weren't, that, that didn't have a lot of trust woven into it. I do not mean that you can't make it better. I just mean it's harder. <laughs> And it takes more effort. So if we could build that into our babies and young children, then we have the best platform from which to grow healthy, confident communities that can engage in lots of the problems that we have in this world. So if I come back to the Gitchin family, we can start to wonder what kind of experiences did they have? What kind of experiences were they offering to their babies? What kind of experiences did they take for granted? How much help was there in the system? How many generations were there around? How many members of your generation? We can wonder that for this family, and we can wonder that for the Anderson family. Because families function in the environment that they're in. They do their best to cope. They live with the messages that they've been given by their culture. And although we can't know, our curiosity becomes a really valuable tool. So here's the good news. Scotland is in the middle of all sorts of attention and queries about childhood trauma or adverse childhood experiences and their impact on the brain, the body, and the behavior. We are doing brilliantly. There's one of the events that we have had is Asa Where's Gone. This image comes from 2018. There's 2,000 people. Like there were 2,500 people over the course of the two days, all in a room together who came together to talk about childhood trauma. Was anybody at this event? Are you trying to find yourself in the I'm trying to see myself. Yes. <laughs> can you see yourself? I actually can, yes. <laughs> I show this photograph a lot, and everybody who was there does exactly that. They're like <laughs> looking for where they are. This hangs in my study, next to my computer, as a moment of hope. Because I take great hope from this. 2,500 people came together to talk about childhood trauma when they didn't have to because enough people in Scotland wanted to think more deeply. This came directly out of the 2017 tour of resilience that Lorene talked about. Because it's true, Tina Henry and I had no idea there was gonna be such interest. Tina and Henry and I were exhausted by the end of that summer. We knew there was a film that was talking about childhood trauma. It was just another tool. And interest in it exploded. And for, did anybody, was anybody at those screenings? Okay, put your hands up high. Have a look around this room. That's maybe, that's not a full quarter of you. One of the things, so there was tremendous energy in 2017, 2018, 2019, <coughs> and some of you were at the, the screenings. <coughs> then this thing called COVID came. And lots of people don't know anything about that. They weren't there. 
the energy got distracted. <clears throat> so there are lots of people who don't know that we have all this interest in ACEs. So those of you who were uh, energized by that, you need to figure out how to tell people who've never heard about it. Because in England, they have not had these gatherings. We are doing really well. Here's another image. This is 2019. That's Gabramonte down there. This is 2023. That's Gabramonte back somewhere in there. We, so Tigers and myself figured out how to host these really big events, which give people lots of energy. So there's a lot of excitement now around Ace Aware Scotland. I'm pleased. I didn't know that was going to happen in 2017. We can take hope from this. There is a vision. Could we be the first Ace Aware nation? How would we do that? What would, they look, what would that look like? How, how, what would that mean? Well, one of the things that it would mean is that it would look like what you're trying to build in East Lothian. Because you couldn't have an Ace Aware nation that wasn't acting on that if you really understood it. But in order to understand it, you have to be able to see pain, such as the ones in the baby videos. So you have a lot to be proud of. You could lead Scotland in this. I don't even, although we came up with the idea, Ace Aware Nation, I don't even really fully know what that looks like. I have ideas about what it might look like. Maybe Aces is not the best language. Maybe it's a great language. In order to talk about the importance of connection, I think you need to also be able to talk about the impact of trauma, disconnection, and adversity. We have a tremendous amount of poverty in Scotland. <clears throat> we have a number of schools who get this. We also have a number of schools full of overwhelmed teachers who have kind of forgotten it. Because just like the mother with the toddler in meltdown in ASDA, once you get overwhelmed, you just want the kid to stop it. There are lots of teachers who are tired and they just want the kids to stop. So in the Scottish Parliament, we recently had a summit on behavior, not on distress. Is that the best language? As I toss out all these linguistic decisions, it lets you decide what you think is the best language and the best way to approach it. Here's one more. This is a video from Public Health Scotland and Bernardo's on, it's all about relationships, which came out in 2020. I love this video. I love that we have the language of relationships. I love that all of this goes together. That's the good news. There's tons to celebrate. Because there's also worrying news. We just had this thing called COVID. And I think it has had dramatic lasting impacts and I'm not sure we've engaged in. So we know that there is a surge in speech delays in young children all over everywhere. If we don't do something about that, every day that goes past that children are not acquiring language in this key early stage will have an impact on their biology, will have an impact on their behavior, and that will carry on. So my, um, if you want strong things that help us to think about it, give it 10 years and I think our prison population will go up because we will have behavior struggles. Empathy is lacking in our young kids. We're seeing lots of different kind of fighting in, and struggles in early years. There was an increase in drinking amongst the parents and the adults, and domestic violence went up during COVID. Those are the contexts in which children were developing. And now we have a cost of living crisis. <coughs> so we need to take the stress of those environments really seriously if we were to think about the impact on children's biology. Because here's the thing. All communities <coughs> function within their historic context, and that's ours. And we need to take it seriously. Maybe we can see it better if we go back in time. So, other families in East Lothian came from a fishing context. That fishing context has decreased. There was a time in which babies didn't ride in car seats. <laughs> they rode behind horses. But our babies now ride in car seats. 
there was a time in which when you went on a picnic, you took your china teacups. <laughs> <laughs> now you purchase sandwiches at Morrison's in plastic. <coughs> and there was a time in which we cared for our elderly people at home. Now, many elderly people are in care homes. How do we create a sense of connection and trust in our historic context? And somehow I think that seeing the pictures of previous times helps us to think more about our time, which is why I think this video of East Lothian families is so fab. So let me comment just for a moment about dementia because we're gonna hear lots more along those lines from Alan, but I just want to drive home my point. Generations working together is trying to think across the lifespan. And what we now know that most of the public doesn't know is that there is growing evidence that the stress you experience as a child has an impact on the likelihood of demonstrating dementia, acquiring dementia, displaying dementia symptoms, whatever language you want to choose. So this is a piece from 1998. So it's not new, but most of the public isn't aware of it. So this is simply a scientific publication which says, in terms of the behavioral symptoms of dementia, ambivalent patients, that means people who don't trust as easily had more depression and anxiety than secure. That is, people who learned as a baby that they could trust. Parents experienced more activity disturbance were higher on paranoid symptomatology than securely attached people. Skip the language. What this says is, that if you have learned to trust as a baby, the world is less threatening. And all of this kind of scientific research is now starting to try, trace the patterns of trust that you have in the baby, which are called attachment styles, and the links between to what we can then see in behavior of dementia. I think understanding this link matters. And you are perfect for doing this because you are generations working together. New research provides evidence that insecure attachment, people who struggle to trust, babies who struggle to touch, is associated with cognitive functioning in older couples. I came across a book chapter that mentioned how attachment could be linked to Alzheimer's disease, and I was hooked, said the study's author. There is so much more that we could do to think about this, about how trust gets built into the system. But when we tried to talk about that by publishing this book, when we tried to link anything to babies, what we found is that we made lots of adults very uncomfortable because they thought we were talking about infantilizing <coughs> adults rather than talking about the core capacity for connection that exists. So if you want to think about this link, this is another of the books we published. The key thing is I think we need to be able to think about how People remain communicative, even the advanced stages of dementia, when we don't always recognize it in the same way that we often don't recognize it for babies. So I think this is important. But I think it's important in bigger ways, and I'm keeping my eye on the time. I want to stress that if we get this idea that what happens in your childhood and your trust has an impact on how you then relate to the world later on, I want to say it has a much bigger message. This is one of my favorite authors, Robin Brill. He talks about how the impacts of childhood matter across time. It matters for big conflicts like Gaza and Israel. It matters for voting patterns, how much you trust a leader, like the voting patterns in America at the moment. And it matters for the kinds of poverty policies that are created by our politicians. All of those, if you want to come back for like a pajama party to unpack them, go back to <coughs> the trust that you have in the world which you acquired as a child. And they matter at a cultural level. 
So we, the thinking about what happens for babies really matters. And when I say babies, I mean early years, that your biology is being shaped. Your trust system is being woven. So finally, let me just say a couple of words, a couple of minutes, about building community. If you get this, if you get what I'm talking about, if just the little bits I've touched on, you feel like you resonate with that, then it gives you the confidence, a deeper kind of confidence, to do the kind of work that you are trying to do. Because people need to follow in your footsteps, because sometimes people are scared. It lets us ask, how? What happened for this family? If they appear to be connected, what happened in their ordinary lives to let a sense of connection reside in their body? And what happened for other families? What happened for them, to them? This is the answer. Put connection at the core. And we design policies and communities that address long-term needs that weave in a trust system at a biological level. How do you do that? Well, I popped this in because Lorene said how much she loves Alison Gopnik's work. Alison Gopnik is another scientist. She talks a lot about grandparents. In fact, she talks about the grandparent hypothesis. So I put this in especially for Lorene. <laughs> Lots of people don't think about grandparents. We're much more likely to talk about early years staff than we are grandparents. But this researcher is Sarah Blaffer Hardy. She wrote a book in which she actually came up with the grandmother hypothesis. And what she said is, women live longer than men because evolution needed grandmothers. <laughs> because grandmothers support mothers to stay calm, to support their children. And if you don't have a sense of connection, you are more likely to lose it with your baby. And essentially, that's what she says. And in fact, she was interviewed this week on a program called The Life Scientific on Radio 4. And I raced across my flag going, oh my gosh, she's in my slides! <laughs> Her work matters. Grandmothers matter. You know that. That is part of your message here. That's what her community looks like in one of her Royal Society of the Arts talks. It looks a little bit different than the Gitschus family. <laughs> but she's trying to find ways to talk about the importance of connection and why it mattered for our evolutionary history as human beings. OK. So as I wind up, what I'm trying to say is if people think what you're doing is sweet, it's not. If, people, if you think what you're doing is sweet, it's not. It's essential. And I just want you to hear me say that so that your confidence increases. This is a birthday party I was at this weekend for a refugee family, who, for their three-year-old son, who was born during COVID. And what the mother of this family said was, I have never had an opportunity for anyone to celebrate my son. So while it looks like a sweet birthday party, it was the first time that publicly any people had ever gathered to celebrate the fact that she had a son. I don't want people to think that that's sweet. I want them to see that community can be created in a moment of birthday parties. And so here's one more as I really do wind up. This organization called Adam Alba. They're not here, they're in North Lanarkshire. But do you know what they decide to do? They decide they're gonna have a Christmas Kaylee. Christmas Kaylee sounds fun. Yay, there will be dancing. It'll be winter warmer. Kayleys are about creating community. And they understand that. So while it will be fun to be there, what they really believe they are doing, and they're just a bunch of people who got together and thought we'll have a Kaylee. They understand that they are building community in an area of Scotland that does that is not talking so loudly about generational working. So they need you, and you need them, and all together, we need to remember <coughs> that communities are the ones that grow trusting springs. Thank you very much. Thank you.